But I do think that, that the kinds of topics that we're talking about here at this conference are, in fact, uh, very much one, ones that will be taken forward in the coming generations. And so it's not inappropriate to think about, well, where is this all going? Is there some sense in which there is a kind of common project here that, that, that people, however they're different their backgrounds are and their specific kinds of interests in virtual futures, whether there's something in common that they have? Um, I mean, because very often it seems that uh, you know, what, what people in a, in a kind of conference like this have in common is escapism, okay? a sort of dislike or disaffection for certain aspects of how the world really is now. Uh, and while that can be a very powerful bond in a way, uh, one hopes that there's something more positive that comes forward. Uh, and, and I want to talk about what those positive things might be. And that's the context in which I raise the issue of humanity 2.0. Now, um, the way I phrased the title of the talk, if you, if you saw it, was, who will recognize humanity 2.0 and will it recognize us, where us is humanity 1.0? Okay, so if we're talking about projecting into a future, right, and it in some sense uh, radically transforms the condition under which human beings have lived, and, and leave that as an open question what that might be, will those beings that in some sense we're working toward or aspiring toward or projecting toward, will they actually have some kind of res re respect for us? Okay, now this is a very important point in terms of providing some kind of long-term legitimation uh, for whatever project we might be engaged in here. Uh, and it's, in fact, a very important part of the way, the, the narrative structure in which we legitimate long-term projects. I mean, the most important one that comes to mind is how we legitimate scientific, uh, scientific inquiry. So when we're talking about scientific inquiry and what's the value of doing science, it's often very difficult to justify just in terms of its face, in terms of what people are doing now. It costs a lot of money. It's very risky. The results are very uncertain. The consequences even more uncertain and sometimes quite risky and dangerous. But it becomes very important then to have some kind of larger narrative in which the contemporary activities are being embedded, you know, in terms of which you would say, well, if Isaac Newton were here today, or Archimedes was here today, or Darwin was here today, they would in some sense validate what we were doing. That we would, they would in some sense see this as a continuation of their projects. Okay? And that even in cases where in some sense we've superseded their knowledge, nevertheless, the spirit of the enterprise continues. In other words, what would be a kind of a nightmare scenario would be to bring Newton, Darwin, Archimedes, whomever, back to today, uh, and and they're being very smart guys, they haven't lost their intelligence in the time travel, understand exactly what we're doing and say, you're something else. You're a different species. You're, 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 you have nothing to do to me, for, with me, right? You, not only do you live in a different time, that time might as well be a, a different place. Could be a different planet. So I understand what you're trying to do, but it has nothing to do with me. And I think actually if, uh, you know, if we entertain that as a very serious proposition, it would undercut actually a lot of the legitimacy for science. Because in a sense, um, the whole idea that we're actually moving in this kind of direction, that there's this momentum, justifies a lot of the costs that people have to pay along the way. And so we have to, as it were, be able to find precedents from the past where something similar has been happening, you know, where there were a lot of costs paid and benefits paid off in the long term. And so I do think that you know, one of the projects, you know, whatever view one has of what humanity 2.0 is, if that's a kind of relevant proposition to people here, then one has to think about, OK, what is the story that leads up to this, right? where we can imagine there be adequate precursors and so forth. And it may actually be coextensive with the history of science. Because I, I, I for example, am someone who believes that to a large extent, all of the kind of commitment, both spiritual and material commitment to the history of science, has largely been about stepping up humanity. Okay, that is what has justified a lot of the risks that have been taken, often uh, in the name of things that did not actually benefit people within their immediate lifetimes. And I think the name that is appropriate for this kind of project that, that I'm talking about at this point is transhumanism. Okay, transhumanism. And, um, and in fact, that is the intent of the term originally. And, I, and, and this is quite important because I want to distinguish transhumanism from posthumanism, which you might say is a more neutral, agnostic, or skeptical view with regard to what I've been talking about so far. 
Because post-humanism doesn't presume that what comes next, as it were, will have any kind of meaningful relationship to the human. Okay. Um, so let me just say a little bit about post-humanism so you get both of these ideas in mind. I would say that a very standard way of thinking about post-humanism, in a way that doesn't involve thinking about high-tech or anything like that, is actually to look at the world from a Darwinian standpoint. Look at the history of life from a Darwinian standpoint. There is, one of the things about Darwin's theory of evolution, you might say, is it's directionless. It is species egalitarian. In other words, there's no sense in which, yes, certain species, as it were, live before other species do and others live afterwards. But there is no sense of direction and certainly no sense of sort of, sort of cumulative growth or human beings as the crowning achievement of life or anything of that sort. That is really not in the spirit of Darwin. I mean, of course, there are other theories of evolution around, and transhumanism deals with that, but Darwin's view is a very species egalitarian view. And it is a view very much about the respect for life, Right? But it is not necessarily about the respect for the qualities of human beings that distinguish us from other life forms. Right? And indeed, one might argue, given the way in which natural selection works and so forth, that the qualities of our existence that distinguish us most from other forms of life are the things that are going to undermine us in the long term. And so what comes after us may not have the overdeveloped cerebral cortex, may not have all these powers of abstraction and so forth that, ena you know, that enable us to hallucinate we can t be masters of the universe. The next species to take our place may have none of that. Okay? Post-humanism is very comfortable with that possibility. There is no privileging of the distinctively human qualities. And indeed, we've even begun to de develop ethics that are relevant to post-humanism, it seems to me, and I, and I always think somebody like Peter Singer is a good benchmark here, where we talk about issues of moral relevance, not pitching it at the level at which human beings are distinguished from other animals. So it's not being pitched at the level of reason. It's not being pitched at the level of autonomy, right? It's not pitched there, um, but rather it's pitched at the level of sentience, right? The ability to feel, to have sensation, which in a sense encompasses a wide variety of creatures. In, in, in nature, okay? Um, and that then be becomes the moral threshold, and that then becomes the way in which life, the value of life starts to become defined, okay? And post-humanism takes this idea kind of seriously as a sort of baseline notion. Now, there are technological versions of it and all the rest of it. I'm not denying that. But it seems to me that the fundamental intuition, what gives it some kind of... Um, Grounding is the idea that one can talk about a value to nature uh, that is independent of the privileging features of human beings. And so there is no humanity 2.0 in this picture. There's just post-humanity. And so one is not worried about this kind of historical narrative question that I, that I raised at the very beginning, because there's a sense in which you really do imagine that species sort of come and go, and every species lives sort of in its own environment and so forth, and copes for as long as it can with the environment, and then moves on and something replaces it. There is no sense of control or mastery or anything like that. Now, transhumanism as a term actually begins at a very interesting moment in the history of biology. Because if you were to go, you know, you go back to the period where Darwin is writing, and uh, um, as you probably know, Darwin was, Darwin was someone who was not only trained in natural history, but also was trained in theology, um, and in fact was very much uh, influenced early on uh, in, in his career when he was a student at Cambridge uh, by the, these kinds of highly rationalistic views, as it were, uh, which, which I think it's fair to say to be spoken of in terms of intelligent design of nature but understood in a very particular way. Namely, this, these were views, and you may know somebody like uh, William Paley, the, the natural theologian, um, who Darwin read very much, and, and who has this book on natural theology that sort of lays out basically all kinds of accounts of creatures in nature and showing how they're adapted to their environments. And not only that, explaining and justifying, you might say, how even the very horrible things that happens to creatures are part of some larger overall pl plan. So what looks, like, what, what looks very bad and evil and awful in a small scale, in the large scale, can actually be seen as part of the larger plan that's unfolding. Now, when Darwin starts traveling around the world and starts to see the way species are operating in native in environments, right, especially as a result of this voyage he took in the Beagle, Darwin really starts to doubt that this is a very credible way of thinking about things. 
That there's just, as it were, you know, too much misery, too much extinction, too much death, too much negativity in nature, as it were, to think about it as somehow part of some, some long-term plan. Um, and the notion of natural selection arises from that, and also the general, you know, the, the, the general attempt, which turned out to be successful rather quickly, namely to remove theology from any kind of consideration uh, in terms of providing a kind of focus for how one should think about biological phenomena. Now, one of the consequences of this kind of move, of course, was a, a very, uh, if you look at Darwin's own attitudes toward human life during his time, Darwin was very reluctant to support any of the movements that were beginning at the time in the late 19th century that we would now associate potentially with transhumanist thinking. So, for example, you know, his cousin Francis Galton started eugenics. Darwin was against that. He didn't support it. He didn't think it would work. Okay? Um, the issues like, for example, vivisection, right, the, uh, the operating on animals uh, in order to, for, for biomedical purposes. Darwin's friend Huxley was very much behind this kind of idea. Um, Darwin accepted it with great reluctance and very much concern about the amount of suffering that would be caused to animals, given what he imagined would be relatively little benefit. Now, all of, this, all of these opinions that Darwin had was, of course, happening in a period before we have the real revolutions that take place, both in genetics and, of course, later molecular biology, which changes our whole way of thinking about this stuff. Okay? Um, and transhumanism gets off the ground at that point. Right? Uh, Darwin is a natural historian. He is a person whose strength is in watching organisms interact in their environments and then talking about them and being a very sensitive sort of observer. Darwin is not someone to go inside of organisms to figure out what they're, what they're made of. And in fact, to really get the revolution in that way of thinking about biological science, you had to import a lot of people with backgrounds in physics and chemistry. I mean, it was as simple as that, and these were deliberately designed ideas. I mean, so in other words, it's not by accident that you end up getting genetics and molecular biology developing as they do in the early 20th century, because there is a deliberate effort to actually go in there. And one effort that's in fact very important um, and if you don't know about it, it's worth always keeping in mind, is the Rockefeller Foundation. The role the Rockefeller Foundation played on both sides of the Atlantic uh, in seeding this field that we call molecular biology, which in a way revolutionizes our, the way we think about heredity and about you know, the way in which life can be taken in new directions. And the, and the phrase molecular biology was coined by the director of the Natural Sciences Division of the, of the, Nash, of the Rockefeller Foundation, this guy Warren Weaver, uh, who you may know from the Shannon Weaver model of information. Okay, he's a mathematician by training, but he was the head of the, uh, of the, of the Nash, National, Natural Sciences Division of the Rockefeller Foundation. In 1934, he publishes this kind of blueprint for establishing a science of molecular biology, the goal of which would be to enhance human performance. Now, the Rockefeller Foundation, generally speaking, was interested in, in, in putting in money in natural and social science research in order to produce more productive people. Okay, so this is a kind of labor-boosting strategy. You want smarter people who can work harder, and then you can produce more, right, and you get a, more prosperity and all the rest of it. And this was kind of the general idea, and molecular biology fitted into this kind of mold, and that was the point of seeding all of the various laboratories, which the universities resisted. Both Harvard and Cambridge were, were very resistant, uh, and, and the people who were working in them had kind of fringe status until really some big discoveries got made. But that was what the idea of molecular, but molecular biology was originally about human enhancement. And it was only after it took a while to actually get to a point where it was possible to do anything regarding enhancement through molecular biology, right? It was only then that that idea got re revived. And in the meanwhile, what you ended up getting is the discipline that we call molecular biology, right? Which is sort of freestanding academic discipline now. But the idea was that basically human beings could take control of evolution. That the project of eugenics, the problem was, it wa was basically that it was too coarse-grained. It wasn't based on a fine and great enough understanding of the genetic mechanisms and their molecular bases. But once that, that was established, then we could revisit those projects. And we could take control of evolution. And so Julian Huxley was one, the person who we normally see as having coined uh, the, the phrase transhumanism, um, was in fact very much on this idea. Okay? Um, and he thought, in fact, in this respect, 
there was a sense of progress in evolution. That there was, as it were, at least one major cut that had taken place once human beings came to understand how evolution works. So a kind of reflexive moment, you might say, takes place in the evolution process, whereby it's no longer just you know, organisms adapting to the environment, but you actually have one organism who can understand the whole thing and then take control of it. And that was the promise of transhumanism, and it's already being articulated in the middle third of the 20th century with the promise of molecular biology, completely changing the way in which people are thinking about the nature of life. Right? Because from Darwin's standpoint, natural selection tr is a trump card, right? Nothing can ever control life. Life is this very unpredictable kind of force, right? You may think you have control over it, but it's very limited, and eventually you die. But here we're talking about people who say, well, now we figured out how life works, and we can start to apply that. And transhumanism gets off the ground at this point. And a lot of the people who were involved in the forging of the, what we call the neo-Darwinian synthesis in biology, that is to say, drawing together the natural history, ecology side that was mostly Darwin's tradition with the kind of new physico-chemical approaches associated with genetics and the nascent sciences of molecular biology, right? The people who were involved in putting that together in the 1930s and 40s were very sympathetic to the transhumanist perspective. So I mentioned Huxley, but probably a person who, uh, in a way, is uh, just as important, especially in the United States con context, is uh, Theodosius Dob Dobjansky, who was the head of the uh, major genetics lab at Columbia University, which was the main place in the United States where genetics was done for a long time. Um, and he was very much a booster of, in a way, one of the great gurus of transhumanism uh, of, of this period in, in history, and that was uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. The Jesuit paleontologist, I'm sure some of you who are familiar with transhumanism have heard of him. Um, and uh, Dobjansky, who you know, is this card-carrying geneticist, serious scientist, head of the major lab in the United States for many years, wrote a book toward the end of his life called The Biology of Ultimate Concern. And it's a kind of theobiology, biotheology or whatever. Um, and it's all about... It's this very interesting kind of mix of what we, would, we might think of as eugenicist thinking and this kind of theological idea of human beings becoming God. Okay, and Teilhard de Chardin, his story about evolution is basically that. Okay, and, and, uh, um, and, and, and Dobjansky was one of the, one of the last uh, presidents of the American Eugenics Society in, in the late 1960s. Okay. Um, so here we get this very kind of literal sense of, uh, of humanity 2.0 in the sense of, okay, through whatever means, let's say natural selection, normal Darwinian processes, human beings have come to have the sorts of bodies and capacities that they have. Now we're in a position to decide which ones do we want to take forward and under what conditions. And that then becomes the project of humanity 2.0. Now, um, what this involves People, people who started thinking about this originally were, in fact, quite open to the various kinds of modifications that could take place. And the problem was that, of course, they didn't actually have the technology to be able to do it, but now we're entering into a phase in which it is becoming possible to do this. And so the next phase of this transhumanism is something that in science policy circles has become very popular, and that is the so-called converging technologies agenda. I don't know how many of you have heard about this, but this is kind of a buzz phrase that is very common on both sides of the Atlantic, both the National Science Foundation in the United States and also uh, in, uh, in the European Union, the idea of converging technologies. So again, you know, think about what transhumanism is in the first instance. Evolution has this kind of natural course, but then when human beings come on the scene, they can take control of it and take it forward in a certain way and give it some kind of focus, give it some kind of direction. Converging technologies, you might say, is a very similar kind of idea, but with regard to the history of science. So you imagine that the history of science, the disciplines kind of move in their own direction through their own research trajectory, but then there comes a point in which we sort of take them and put them all together and then direct them toward this larger human good. And so the particular technologies we're talking about are based on nanotechnology, biotechnology, information science, and the cognitive sciences. And so, the, and so the idea would be to find, provide uh, research funding to enable these disciplines to move in directions that enable them to work more closely with each other for purposes of enhancing human beings at all sorts of levels of human uh, performance that one might be concerned about. 
Now, this is a big, uh, I, I, uh, I was part of, a, of an EU project a few years ago that actually kind of examined the extent to which this sort of policy agenda was actually motivating research on the ground. And it does seem to have some interesting kinds of influences in terms of the way people are training, in terms of the way people are oriented, and in terms of sort of justifying science as something other than just useful stuff that can be used in many different ways. This whole idea that, as it were, the enhancement of humanity becomes the point of science. And that's what this project's about. Now, this, I, this kind of idea is a, quite a, an old idea. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, one of the things uh, that, you know, if you want to look at a precedent for this, um, you could go back to the 19th century. And I don't know, um, if you look at somebody like the Count Saint-Simon, who was a, a person who was, he's associated with uh, Auguste Comte, the fa who's a person who coins the word positivism and sociology. And this was one of the, these two guys, Saint-Simon and Comte, had this idea that in a sense, what humanity 2.0 is, is the realization of humanity. So that all the knowledge that is being de developed in many different places would be gathered together, focused by government means, and then be used to actually turn human beings into this extraordinary species. And this is where social science to a large extent came from, was from that earlier initiative. That social science would actually provide this kind of collective intelligence that would enable human beings to rise to the next level. Now the history of this project of social science, as you probably know, um, is a very checkered one. And of course along the way, when we start with Saint-Simon Comte, we of course get all the various socialist projects which these guys were also associated with in their own way prior to Marx. But you also get, you get the socialist projects, and you get all sorts of other social scientifically driven projects to radically transform the environments and even the makeup of people in the name of some sort of higher notion of humanity. And it seems to me that the kinds of stuff that we are talking about here at this conference takes this whole trajectory that I've been talking about to the next level, potentially. Only now the technologies are, are rather different. Okay, I mean, in th this conference seems to emphasize mostly sort of the information technology side, but of course, nano, bio, and cognitive stuff is, of course, all together in this new uh, development. But it's the same kind of idea taking place. And yet, there's always been a lot of pushback to the idea that human beings, in some sense, have this kind of prerogative to be able to boost themselves up to this sort of higher level of significance. And I think this is where we have to think about what exactly is the aim of the project here. Because it's one thing to say, well, we don't like the way in which the world is currently being governed. We don't like the way in which uh, you know, people relate to each other or to things and so forth. But it's another thing to say that there's also this kind of collective project. Um, now, the reason why the collective project of Humanity 2.0 has had such great currency, a lot of it has to do with the fact that governments have always been worried about these kinds of advanced forms of knowledge and technology actually getting into the hands of people who can then just use it for their own purposes. And as you know, um, we are living in a period that I would describe um, as bioliberal, uh, which is to say that the kinds of issues that, let's say, in the past were talked about in eugenics, which were very state-based, where the government makes a decision about what sort of people should live and die and so forth, that's now been distributed. Right? There's relatively little regulation on these kinds of matters because a lot of the technologies and, 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 and uh, processes that are relevant to this new form of eugenics, really the state doesn't have much ability to capture or regulate in any way. And so these are popping up in lots of different places, in lots of different forms. I mean, uh, you know, one example I like to bring up is this phenomenon of cosmetic neurology on the, on the uh, model of cosmetic surgery. Okay, where in some sense you get your synapses tuned up so that you can, you can function better in a more competitive environment. Um, and, and there's lack of government regulation on this in the, to the same extent that there's lack of government regulation on cosmetic surgery. Okay. Um, and this is very indicative of the sort of bioliberal times in which we live, where people are kind of comfortable with that situation. Everybody makes their own choices, as it were, as to what to do, but there is no sort of overarching, larger, collective, normative sense of humanity that we should be working toward in this. And so I think that's going to be a real challenge there. Um, and you see, the post-humanists, people who are really post-humanists and have a kind of profound indifference to the human, their attitude will be, 
we'll just let, let this run its course. Some people will benefit, some people will not. The, the planet may sort of undermine itself, but that's just kind of part of how things go. And that one shouldn't, as it were, get too exercised about the long-term value implications of this. Okay? So I do think we do have this kind of different sort of perspectives that are operating here, this sort of transhumanist perspective, which in a way is carrying forward a lot of the sort of the old motivation for science and the old privileging of human beings, which I think ultimately has a kind of theological root to it and is really pushing that hard, versus this kind of more laid-back post-humanist sensibility, which basically is a kind of pan-Darwinism, says, well, you know, people will do different things, creatures will do different things, and what will happen will just be some kind of emergent effect down the line, and that there's no sense or point in which one can talk about controlling it. But I do think that this is kind of a very interesting kind of argument that needs to be had. Because on the one hand, we've got people like Peter Singer, who I think is a kind of post-humanist in a very strong way. But on the other hand, we've got people like Ray Kurzweil, who is on the opposite end, right? Who in a way is a very radical transhumanist, who in a sense thinks, well, what's valuable about human beings, right, is some kind of notion of consciousness, perhaps, or some kind of reasoning capacity that can be digitally transformed into some other medium. And that's the thing that you want to have continue indefinitely. So in a sense, our biological bodies that we were born with, the sort of thing that's the focus of Darwinian evolution, is just a contingent feature of who we are. Right? It just so happens it has taken six billion years or whatever for us to have the bodies we have. But now that we've got these bodies, the properties that come from them are the things that are worth preserving not the bodies themselves, but what those bodies can do. And we want to figure out, as it were, better ways of doing what we can do with those bodies. So in other words, yes, we have these wonderful brains, produce all this wonderful knowledge and so forth. That's not an argument for keeping our bodies around. That's an argument for, in fact, coming up with a better, a better material form to do the same thing, if not more. And I take it that's where Kurt's file is coming from where in a sense there's a, one wants to, as it were, preserve mind, if you want to use the old philosophical term, but the body is contingent. And so you can move from one material container to another. For six billion years it's been carbon, next six billion maybe silicon. Who knows, right? But the point is we are not intimately, we, we are not intrinsically part of that biological process. We're only contingently part of it. I think that's a really big different perspective from the kind of person like Peter Singer, who in a sense says that our nature is tied to our biology just as it is tied to everything else that's around. And that the kind of transhumanist dreams of somebody like Kurzweil just need to be dismissed out of hand. And so I do see that there are these, these are really divergent perspectives, both of which do have very strong precedence in Western intellectual history. Basically, whether we are ultimately part of nature, one of the animals, or whether we are somehow on our way to becoming God. And in some sense, our animal existence is just a way station to that. Okay, and these are two very, very different views. And I think at some point, I mean, that these issues need to be argued out much more explicitly about the future in which these various sorts of technologies get taken. And I will stop here. I do have two minutes, but I want to open this up to question to allow other people to speak. Okay. Thank you.